good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here this morning in Coomer Moore. Welcome to our morning service. And um, whether you're here in the building or you're watching online, we trust you'll enjoy worshiping God with us this morning. And that's what we're here to do, to worship God together. And to do that, we need to focus our minds. We've all come in from what I'm sure has been a, a busy week. Many of us have perhaps had a, a busy morning already. So let's take time out to be still this morning, to focus on God and on His Word. And so at the outset of the service, I'd like to read a psalm, Psalm 145, just as we focus on who God is and on how He keeps His promises. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty act. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are fallen and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call him. To all who call on him in truth, he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. God is a God who is true. God is faithful. Verse 13 says, The Lord is faithful in all his works. And we read a number of promises from him in his word and we can rely on So we're going to stand and we're going to sing of those promises now as we stand and sing, standing on the promises.
Thank you, George. Thank you. We switched on. No. Something not working. Well, it's in mute. <laughs> Hello, Mr. <laughs> Good to see you all uh, this morning. And um, uh, George has been mentioning there uh, about the camp. Uh, if you can help out, please do. Uh, I think there's what 36 registered already. I think the 40 is, is the cap for it all. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, this Wednesday night, the reason I mentioned is this Wednesday night, um, we're we'll doing the Bible study on Elisha. Um, but we want to focus our prayer time really on the camp, which starts then the following uh, Wednesday. So I want to encourage everybody to come along. We've had tremendous times uh, late on Wednesday nights. Wednesday night passed. Amazing to see uh, how many were gathered out in the holiday week. 
and uh, we'd love you to come, especially if you're involved in the camp. We'd love you to come on Wednesday night and join with us in prayer. We'd love you there every Wednesday night, um, but this Wednesday night in particular, uh, if you can come along and say join with us so we can focus uh, really on the, the youth camp that then starts the following uh, Wednesday uh, morning. Now, uh, over the summer, different ones have been out serving the Lord, and uh, uh, we, we've been hearing a little bit from them next Sunday night. Then we're going to hear from Luke and Emily as they talk about their Lanzarote trip. Grace uh, Wilson has already been to Poland. And uh, we're going to hear about that on a future occasion as well. But Grace hasn't finished her travels yet, so she hasn't. Um, because Grace and Bethany Stewart and Olivia Smith are going to go away. Uh, are going away tomorrow. I'm going to ask them to come up here. And I think Grace is going to be the spokeslady uh, for them. And uh, just to tell us a little bit about really what they're doing this week, uh, where they're going, and uh, uh, who, who, who's it with really. Thank you. Yep, so we're going to Tarnwood Forest Park um, with Colin Tinsley. So we've been running camps down there all this month. So to take you back, the week came back on Sunday for that. Thursday they set up and started camp. Wednesday and Thursday they set up and had their first weekend that Friday. So we're the Monday of last week. So we've hit the nail on the head and we're going to Friday and set up for like every other camp. So um, I'm a bit up tired when I'm going to come back for a couple of hours. And you're staying in camps? Staying in army tents for the week, yeah. So um, I need to go put that myself into. I've been there every six or seven times now, so I'm sort of used to it. I think it's great. Um, and, and you're washing the river? You're washing the river, yeah. Like, well, you were allowed to use the facilities until well, last year, they put a stop to that. And leaders were advised not to, and campers were not allowed to, so was the river was like you washed that. Well, you will not have you next week. <laughs> we don't want any smell next week, so I don't. Um, tell me, campers, you, you are going to help. Um, what age group uh, are the campers, and uh, how many are you expecting this week? Campers are 8 to 15, 16, and we do have one a little bit younger. Um, and then I think there was, I don't even know, I think there was one hundred or 200, did you say, or something oh, like right. that. Right. Um, and then, okay, your responsibilities as, as leaders then, as helpers? Leadership, well, you start your day with devotion, you end up with the devotion, you start to finish your day with God, basically. That's, that's just the way it all works, it's the same <coughs> um, So we just have a bit of time or somebody will lead your devotion, and then you'll go and do small groups, and you just pray for the day, and pray for, you know, just your usual. Um, and just you know, do a morning exercise, make up the kids do morning exercise every morning at the half eight or twenty past eight. Um, then keep your breakfast coming in. Um, during the motion we'll have a, a seat so there's chores to do. Because it's such a big camp, you know, you have to wash dishes and clean out the toilets and all kinds of stuff. Um, and you will walk in the day, pick up the rubbish every day as well. And then there's also the obviously for the meetings and we have to say what we think right out early and what we will do so memory worship and things and I did different things too. So, so these chores are what you normally do at home anyway? I accept, yeah. <laughs> and then we have devotions to do with our tents as well. So each tent is given to your three junior leaders. And then we have to do devotions of them every night as well. And then the afternoon and so there's activities. Uh, yeah, there's breakfast and then you're more waiting more to give your activity. And then you do lunch and then you do the activity. And then you have hours to give a snack in between that. And then you have another meeting, and then you have dinner, and then you maybe do something else, and then you'll supper, and then you have devotion, and that's ten times. You eat six times a day, so. I was going to say, all the days are being food, so there's. I think there's about another 21 staying up and going to be involved this week. That's great, considering you're in the forest. So they do, excellent. Uh, so you don't have to go and find your food before no, no. <laughs> That's not so bad. So, okay, um, obviously, we want to pray for you. Yes. But you're not the only ones that are away this week because, well, there's a man returning home this week. Uh, I'm going to ask Nathan to come up, Nathan Tom. Nathan uh, joined with us about a year ago and uh, he's up here in work placement for a number of years. I'll take that, thank you. And um, I, I was wondering, is he going back home because maybe his visa's running out or something? But um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, Nathan, obviously, your, your dad, Mervyn Tom. Working with uh, the camp centre down in Durham. Uh, what county is that in? Uh, county Leith. 
Three and a half hours. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so you're going down this week, you're going back home again, just for the week? Just for the week. Just for the one week. week is enough. One week's enough. <laughs> um, you didn't say, well, there's one week's enough for them or for you. Um, but uh, obviously, the camp then this week, uh, the camp center in the has been used all summer. What, what is the specific camp then that you're on? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's there, our parents, the faith mission there, first, first or three weeks of camp they're doing. So it's this week there's eight to ten year olds, so there's 50, 58 to ten year olds coming. Right. So uh, there's about 20 leaders helping out. So it's Right. Um, the, the, the kids, are they, obviously in the South of Ireland, we know it's a different situation down there. You find the kids are, are from church background, or is there quite a number of them from home church background? Uh, there will be some from a church background, but a lot of them, the very, the only sort of church or Bible input that they've been getting is from our campus, and from campus for school assemblies. And that's, that's about it. Something that they're not here in the Bible until they come next year. You know, it's, it's very, like even some of the, the we, we encourage them or ask them to bring a Bible with them to camp. Some of them are not even able to do that. Even, not even, not, not, even if you tell them to find the New Testament and the Bible, it's not going to go. You know, it's, 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 but it's, 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 it's a whole experience here. And, um, well, you, your camp is, is Monday to Friday. Uh, and the camp is your own day to Monday to Friday. Monday morning to Friday. Friday evening. Sunday morning. It's the whole thing. You're going to have them down tonight for the day. Uh, Leaders, leaders, we can sell and talk this evening, sort of get to work together and plan for that. Right, right. And, and, and basically, share a little bit about what the, the, the as leaders are all doing at camp. What's your responsibilities throughout the week? Oh, it's rough to say the same as Grace and all. It's sort of the pra practical elements, washing dishes, um, helping out with the games, activities, um, getting the meetings and all. You know. More than anything we do is quite kind of often, so I'm, I'll be in a group of four or five young children and we to sort of just discuss, discuss that in one or that evening's Bible story and then we'll be away on activities during the afternoon, so sort of, sort of if we're going shopping or going out somewhere else, sort of keep an eye for they're only they're eight to ten year olds, so, you, so they can have a, a completely different mind to, you know, some of these different orders, you know, so keep an eye on them. Okay, okay. Shopping. Don't think the sound of that, but anyway. Well, here we want you to know as well that uh, we're praying for you. I hope I haven't left any mistake and anybody. These are the ones I uh, heard going away this week. Hopefully there's nobody else. But if you are going in somewhere and serving on a team or whatever uh, throughout the summer, please, please do say to us so that we can, as a church, really stand with you uh, in, in prayer for it all. But we want to pray now and commend uh, the two camps to the Lord and pray the Lord to bless those who are going to serve. Father, we do thank you for what we've been hearing this morning. We thank you, Father, for your grace in our lives, Father, for saving us, and uh, Father, for the privilege as well then of being able to serve you. And we thank you, Father, over the summertime there are many camps run by many different organisations, and we rejoice, our Father, in the boys and girls and young people that are being reached with the gospel through, through these camps. We look forward to our own camp starting Wednesday week, but Lord, we think of this incoming week. We do pray, Father, for grace for Bethany and for Olivia as they go to Tully Moore with Hope for Youth Ministries. And uh, Father, for uh, your help to be given in every way, our Father, in that camp. For Colin as he leads it. Father, for all the young people, boys and girls who will come along to that. And we pray, Father, that the Spirit of God will be moving in hearts and lives throughout this week. That this will not only be a week of sowing the good seed of the Word of God, but it will be a week of harvest as well. That many, Lord, will come to know Christ. That whenever they return, they'll return with great joy, our Father, in, in young ones putting their trust in Christ. And likewise for Nathan, and for the work of the faith mission, uh, Father, down in Durham. We pray your blessing on his mum and dad as they lead that uh, camp centre. We pray, Father, for Nathan as he goes down and as he uh, gets involved, our Father, that you'll give help to him also. And then also, Lord, throughout this week, it'll be a great week, Lord, of many coming to Christ, great rejoicing amongst the angels in heaven over sinners coming and putting their trust in Christ. We pray the weeks, our Father, the two camps will, will, will go well, our Father, that there'll be no accidents, no injuries. We pray, Father, your protection upon all. Protect them from the attacks of, of Satan. We know he loves to get in and uh, try and destroy everything, but we pray that your hate of protection will be about it all. So, Father, we commend them to you and pray your blessing upon them all. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
to that amount. So thank you, Lord bless, and do please pray for them uh, throughout this week. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, before Alan comes to share from God's word, we'll stand and sing our offering him, leaning on the everlasting arms. So we'll remain in our seats for the first two verses and then stand. Um, after this hymn, um, the, the teachers and children of the Sunday school.
The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make another end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Well, in there at verse 8, we know God once again will bless his word to all of our hearts this morning. At times, it, it, I'm sure you feel the same, that this world can look like it's out of control and it's, it's almost spiralling into oblivion, as we would say. And, and certainly, I think whenever we look at politics and we look at world events and so forth, I think we would all say that certainly that's how it feels at the present moment in time. We know that this world is, is full of trouble. It's full of sin and perhaps much of what is going on, I'm not saying that everything that is going on, but perhaps much of what is going on is because God is pouring out judgment and punishment upon this wicked world. Probably the last time things felt so unstable, and most of us won't even have a clue about it at all, but perhaps the last time things felt so unstable and so uncertain worldwide was probably during the time of the Second World War. And few there are, say, nowadays who can remember what it was really like a way back then. These are, without doubt, unprecedented times. The feeling concern among many is what is going on worldwide? It looks like it's never going to end. I don't know about you, but perhaps you're somebody that you, maybe you don't watch the news now because it's always depressing. Uh, or, or maybe you just catch the headlines to see, well, what is going on? But that's as far as it goes when it comes to watching the news. And we're, we're, we're maybe filled with many questions, maybe many concerns to say, we, we, we wonder, are things ever going to return to the way that we knew even they were just a few years ago? Will petrol, diesel and home heating oil, will it ever get back to what we would see is a more affordable price. Will food prices ever come down again? Will building materials ever come down in price? Will new housing ever be affordable again to, to many first-time buyers? Will we always be living with worldwide pandemics? Will COVID ever uh, come to an end? Is COVID going to dominate the way of life for many years? And what is it we've just heard? I think was it yesterday or Friday? World Health Organization uh, declared that uh, monkeypox now is uh, a worldwide pandemic. Will our health service ever be able to reduce the horrendous waiting times for major surgery and treatment that many people are experiencing at the present day? What's going to be the outcome of the war in Ukraine? Will Putin hit the nuclear button as we uh, often read or hear that he is threatening to do. And on and on I could go with many things in the present day that, that are causing much trouble within the hearts of many people. And really the question then that is asked, and um, I, I know that uh, Luke was addressing even this last week with the text that we were looking at in Romans chapter 12, but the question that, that is asked is how do we cope with all of this? How are you coping with it all? I trust that you're coping well with it. And I trust you're coping well because I believe the answer to it all is this, is the promises of the unchanging God. We were singing the opening hymn this morning, Standing 
on the promises of God, my King. Is that what we're doing in these present days? Are we people who are turning to the Word of God for all the help that we need and reminding ourselves of the tremendous promises that we have in the Word of God? And I mention that because I believe that one of the great promises that we have in the Word of God and how to be with uncertain times is what we have here in the book of Nahum, chapter 1 and verse 7, where we read these words, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Now the book of Nahum, it may uh, be a book that we're not too familiar with, but the prophet Nahum was a man who was sent by God to, to the city of Nineveh. And he was sent there to, to warn them of coming judgment from God, unless they repented of their sin. Now, whenever I mention Nahum or uh, Nineveh, you're probably thinking, well, we, we knew about the city of Nineveh because uh, Nahum was not the first one that was sent there because actually it was Jonah. And it's, it's, it's estimated it was about 100 years previously that Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh to proclaim the word of God. We were looking at that just a few weeks ago as we looked at Jonah chapter 3 and verse 2 because what we know is Jonah rebelled against God. He went the opposite direction to what God was asking him to do but we looked at the God of the second chance because in chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2 we read of how that the word of God came unto Jonah the second time and it was the second time then uh, that he responded in obedience and he went to Nineveh and there he proclaimed the word of God and what has happened in Nineveh there was a great revival God worked in a mighty way and, and, and many came to know the Lord but sadly down through the generations that followed on many of them they went back to idol worship and to sinful living and indeed that's a reminder to us that we cannot rest on, on the blessings of the past that as a people of God, we cannot say, well, we've seen God work in the past, now we can take it easy. We still need to be seeking God. We need to be seeking Him, I believe, more now than ever, that we don't depend on revivals like the 1859 revival. Um, uh, they, they estimate there was a, a, a mini revival in 1959 as well. We, we dare not wait till 2059 and say, well, that's when the next revival is going to be. We ought to be seeking revival now. I'm praying that God will work amongst us and, and, and that God will come and do a great work in these days. But say what happened in Nineveh was that after a generation or two, they got back into their old ways. They got back into sinful ways. They got away from God. And God sent Nahum then to, to challenge them as a people. And to declare that God was going to send judgment upon them unless they repented of their sin. But what's interesting about the, the, the name of Nahum is that actually his name means comfort. And we know that he was sent to the people of Nineveh about a hundred years after Jonah had been there to, to warn them about judgment and, uh, and to warn them that they needed to turn their back on God. But where does, it, where does the word comfort or where does the meaning of his name really uh, 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 where, where, where does this speak to a group of people? Well, it speaks to the people of the two southern tribes of Israel, the two tribes of Judah. Because while Nahum was sent to, to pronounce judgment on Nineveh and the people there, unless they repented of their sin, he was also sent to bring comfort to the people of Judah, to the two tribes of Israel uh, that, 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 that made, up the, uh, the, made up Judah. And therefore said he was a man who was sent to bring comfort. And really what we see is, we, if you go back to chapter 1 here in verses 1 and 2, we see how that, that God was going to send the wrath, the burden of Nineveh. That's what it says there in the opening words of, of chapter 1. The book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishai, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is fear. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Now what we need to remember is that Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It was the Assyrians who had previously taken the northern ten tribes of Israel off into captivity. Remember there was a divide in the kingdom. 
See, the ten, the ten tribes of the north, they were Israel, they'd been taken off into Assyria. Uh, no doubt they were done, uh, those who had been taken away into Nineveh itself. And the Assyrians, what we know is that they threatened Judah as well. And really that was the background to it all here. They threatened Judah as well. So it would have been comforting to them to hear from Nahum that God was going to pronounce judgment on the Assyrians, on the people of Nineveh. But along with this, that God was assuring them their protection. As Nahum declared to them this wonderful truth that we should take upon our hearts this morning. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knew of them that trust in him. So as we look at this in, in light of its context, its background, but as we look to apply it to our own hearts today, three very simple truths that I want to highlight from, uh, from this verse this morning. I want to highlight, first of all, God's character. God's character, that's what stands out at the very start of this verse. But it's a funny world, I believe, that we live in because, and I say this because you see, whenever terrible things happen in the world, what is it happens? Well, immediately people turn against God. And they say all sorts of terrible things about God. But yet, whenever things are good in the world, people have no time for God. And they do not even acknowledge the goodness of God. Whenever a tragedy happens that affects many people across the world, even uh, maybe a tragedy locally or maybe even a tragedy in our own lives, what is it is the response of many people? Well, many people, they hate God. They blame God. But yet when life is good, they don't either acknowledge God's goodness or many of them, what is it they do? They even deny God's existence. That is, they deny his existence until something terrible happens. It's not, it's not one of the strands, I don't know if you've ever noticed that. People who say they're atheists, and whenever, whenever things are good in the world, and God is good to people, atheists will turn around and they say, well, we don't believe in God, but yet whenever there's a terrible tragedy, it seems to be they, they all of a sudden they believe in God. But they, they, they blame God for all the wrong that is happening in this world. And, and, and maybe it's something how, or maybe something along these lines is how we feel at times, or, or maybe it's how we let Satan control our thinking. So whenever things are good, maybe we don't acknowledge God, God's goodness as we should. But when things become difficult for us and things weigh in heavily upon us or overwhelm us, maybe then we start to question God and, and is God good? Two men in the Bible who didn't let Satan do this to them were Job and, 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 and Joseph. And, and I think we all really know their stories quite well. We think of Job, he lost ten children and, and, and his wealth all uh, within a day. Yet we read in Job chapter 1 and verse 22, Job said this, or says this about him, and all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And, and what it means is he didn't come and say, God, this is all your fault, you're a terrible God. And, and, and he didn't come and declare that he hates God. What we see is that he is a man who trusted God through it all. And likewise, Joseph. We, 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 we looked at Joseph the first year that uh, that I was here, that we went through the life of Joseph, we did those studies and we saw how he, he was a man that the word of God never declares anything sinful about him, yet we know that he was a sinful man who was trusting in God, but yet as he went through those terrible circumstances, as he was uh, hated by his brothers, as then as he ended up in prison on the false accusations of, of Potiphar's wife, how we know that yet he was a man that through it all, he trusted in God. He never turned against God in any way at all or blamed God or took it out with God. Another man said he knew what God's character was like was surely this man, Nahum. We don't know much about his personal circumstances, but yet... When he considered what was about to happen in Nineveh, he was still able to say this, that the Lord is good. That might seem a strange thing to some of us this morning. God was about to punish the people of Nineveh, the Assyrians. 
And yet through it all, what is it was, was uh, Nahum's testimony to God, that God is good. That God is good even though he's going to do this. I was trying to think, how do we explain this uh, in our present day? Well, many of us here today, we, we are parents. And um, I, I suspect that if I, that I, well, I hope that if I, I spoke to wives today, if I spoke to you women, you wives today, you mothers, and um, uh, asked you, what do you think of your husband? Well, you would say that your husband is a good man. I hope you would anyway. Um, or else we'll have, to, we'll have to organize marriage counseling, so we will. But I suspect you would say that your husband is a good man. Now, your child misbehaves. Now, we know that would never happen. But assuming your child misbehaves, um, and your husband then steps in and disciplines your child, does it change your opinion of your husband? No. Well, I believe it wouldn't. That you would still say that your husband is a good man. He, he's somebody who is disciplining your child. Your child is misbehaved, and you want to teach your child how to behave in, in the future. You, you, you want to, to knock that sinful uh, way out of their lives, and, and your husband, he steps in and he disciplines your child in whatever way he does it, when you would still believe that your husband is a good man. The Ninevites disobeyed God, and they had been warned many times about their sin. God had, say, remember what he had done through Jonah, and, and it had been passed on down through the generations. But, and, and God, they, they, they knew what right was and what wrong was. They knew what God demanded of them, they knew what God expected of them, and yet they, 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 they ignored the warnings of God, they disobeyed the word of God, saying nobody can say that God wasn't good. Because they had been warned, but yet they chose to live in rebellion to God. The great truth today for us all is that God is good. God is good even in the midst of times that are uncertain, unprecedented. Times that maybe fill us with fear. So we're maybe looking at the world's situation and where's it all going. Well, we know where it's all going. It's all going towards the return of Jesus Christ because the Bible tells us things will wax worse and worse. The Bible tells us about many of these things that will happen in the last days and we see, we see God as where he's put in his picture or each little piece of the jigsaw into place. But yet at times we can look at our own circumstances personally and wonder how, how, how's it all going to work out for us and, and, and where, where do we fit into it all? Well the great truth today is that it doesn't change God's character because God is good. And something we read in the word of God is something that um, Luke read in Psalm 145, a, a, a favourite psalm of mine. A, a great psalm where it says, and it says that the, the Lord is good to all. And that's something that you, you see in the Word of God. A couple of references there you'll see on the screen. Psalm 34 and, 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 and verse 8. Uh, it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Say in response to it all, may we delight in this wonderful truth. Or should, putting it into good old language for ourselves here, people, that we love our food. Grace was telling us about how camps all about food this week. But when we think of, uh, of it, when we think of God's goodness, may we indulge in it. Because that's what the psalmist said, we taste and see. But the Lord is good. Don't we love food? We love particular foods more than others. And there's certain foods that we just love to get our teeth into because of the taste of it all. And how it, it, it warms our heart, it thrills our heart. And, and say so we just love to indulge in it. Maybe sometimes we indulge too much in it. God wants us to indulge in him and his goodness. Times we know we struggle to see it, but yet sometimes it's whenever we step back from things. We take our eyes off the problems of this world and we focus our eyes completely on God. What we see is a God who is good to all. Even in heartbreaking circumstances. It's been lovely over the years. It's been one of my privileges as a pastor 
that even in heartbreaking circumstances with people, you hear people turn around and say, The Lord is still good. May we delight in Him or indulge in Him, but may we speak about it as well. Psalm 107 and verses 1 and 2 Give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I believe if there's something that the world needs to hear in the present day, it's this truth. God is good. That God is good. Because all the word it is hearing is all the negative things, all the bad things and, and, and that's happening in this world and people, there are many people have this mindset that, that, that it's all because God is a terrible, terrible God. You may be saying, well, how do we tell them God is good? Well, we tell them God is good because he's long-suffering. But he's still giving them the opportunity to see it. That even in the midst of terrible days and dark days and terrible times, and yet God is extending his, his offer of mercy to sinners to come and put their trust in him. That in the midst of it all, if they trust Christ as their saviour for salvation, that they will experience the wonderful joy of sins forgiven, of knowing that indeed that this world is, they're just passing through and there's a wonderful eternity that awaits them. Because those who trust in God will be in heaven forever. Surely we can say today the Lord is good. You're not saved. Today he's, he's inviting you. He's given you this opportunity to come. We know that many people, they mock the Lord's return and they'll say, oh, but in the church he's been saying for years and for centuries and for, I say, for many, uh, many years that, 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 that Christ could return at any time. But here we are. We're still in this world. He hasn't returned. Do you know why he hasn't returned? Because he's not willing that any should perish. Not willing that you should perish. <coughs> Today he longs that you come and put your trust in him. And yet what we know is that one day will come when he will say, it's time to return. The father will say to him, it's time to return. Go back, receive our own unto ourselves. Yet take us home to glory. Those who be left behind will perish in hell forever and ever. You need to come put your trust in him today. You need to be saved today. You need to call upon him. Judgment is coming. That's what we see here in this verse. Judgment was coming upon those who were rejecting God. But for those who uh, were trusting in God, uh, in the midst of it all, they him could see the Lord is good. So we see God's character. I want you to see secondly, hopefully we'll move on there. Nathan, thank you. God's care. I love this middle part of this verse. We see, secondly, God's care. What is it he goes on to say? He's a strong hold in the day of trouble. This tells me two things. First of all, it tells me that there will be days of trouble for those who follow the Lord. That's not the gospel that many preach, sadly. They say, Come to the Lord. Oh, it'll be like a, it'll be like a bed of roses. Um, I think they forget that in amongst the roses there's thorns, isn't there? And sometimes some of us we feel the thorns more than anything else. There's days of trouble. But God knows there'll be days of trouble. But yet what God says, secondly, is that in those days of trouble, he will be a fortress to us. He will be a, a fortress to us. He will be that stronghold. The word stronghold, it simply means fortified. God provides a fortified place to us. He will be a defense for us. And, and the wonderful truth is that when you run through Scripture, run your way through Scripture, it's what you see time and time again. I've given you just a, 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 a number of verses there, really, uh, for you to be blessed. As you think of how God will be that stronghold, of how he will be that fortress, we think of Psalm 18 and verse 2. Psalm has said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And my deliverer, my God, my strength in him will I trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and, and my high tower. All this uh, language that is given us this imagery of how God will protect us from the, from the enemy who is attacking. Psalm 91 and verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my fortress, I'm sorry, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God and him will I trust. 
Psalm 144 and verse 2, all these, uh, I realised when I was, I was jotting these down, they're all verse 2, so they are. Um, uh, Psalm 18, verse 2, Psalm 91, verse 2, Psalm 144, verse 2, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and in him, and he in whom I trust who subdueth my people under me. And then Second Samuel, and verses 1 and 2 of chapter 22, David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Surely this today warms our hearts as we have the battles of life. As we face the challenges of life and the challenges of this world, Matthew Henry of old in his commentary, he says this, I love these words, he says, The same almighty power that is exerted for the terror and destruction of the wicked is engaged and shall be employed for the protection and satisfaction of his own people. He is able both to save and to destroy. In the day of public trouble, when God's judgments are in the earth, laying all waste, he will be a place of defence to those that by faith put themselves under his protection, those that trust in him in the way of their duty, that live a life of dependence upon him and devotedness to him. You see, this is our great confidence today, whatever our great enemy be. It can look like everything and everyone is against us. But isn't it a wonderful truth that greater is he that is in us? And he that is in the world, and he that is against us, and he that is seeking to destroy us. 1527 was one of the most trying years of, of Martin Luther's life. We all know about Martin Luther, the reformer, and the impact that he had upon this world. And sometimes whenever we whenever we look back in history, um, whenever we look back at people and the great things that that they have done that have that have impacted this world and certainly whenever we look at people in the you know, in the Christian life who, um, who who stood up for God we can sometimes then picture in our minds that that life for them was great all the time that that that, that life was almost that bed of roses for them all the time but yeah whenever you look into their lives what you see is that uh, for a good percentage of their life, for many of them, life was really difficult and they faced many challenges. One of them was Martin Luther. It was on April the 22nd that a dizzy spell forced Martin Luther to stop preaching in the middle of his sermon. See, for 10 years since publishing his 95 thesis, which he kneeled against the, uh, the door of the castle in, 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 in Wittenberg, uh, for, for 10 years, he then suffered abuse uh, really from so many other people. We know his thesis, it was against the abuse of indulgences. But, but for many years then, Luther, he was buffeted by political and theolog theological storms. And at times his life was in real danger. We know that he was a man who also suffered depression. A great man of faith. A great man used by God, or a man used by God in a great way, and yet he was somebody who suffered depression because of all that was against him and all that was going on in his life. And sometime in that year, in 1527, he wrote the hymn that he is most famous for. It's, it's this, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. First verse says, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a bulwark never failing, or helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work his woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. And then verse 3 says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his, tri his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. We know Satan's against us. But 
God is for us, and so much did this hymn and the truth of it all mean to Martin Luther that in fact the first line of it, the mighty fortress is our God, is what's inscribed on his tomb. So we see God's character, we see God's care. I want you to know thirdly, how beautiful this is, God's consciousness. God's consciousness, look here at what he says in verse, verse 7, the Lord is good. A stronghold, a fortress in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. What a truth for us today, you receive. He knoweth them that trust in him. Immediately reminded, and you see it there, John chapter 13, sorry, John chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. Reminded of the beautiful words of the Lord Jesus. In these verses, the hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling who careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd who know my sheep and am known of mine. You're known by mine. J. Bernie McGee, I'm going to use a lengthy quote, but I think it summarizes this so beautifully uh, and something that should be an encouragement to us today. J. Bernie McGee says this, I'm very happy that I'm not going to get lost in the shuffle, that I won't get lost in the multitudes. As I travel from city to city, I sometimes think that everyone has moved to the West Coast. He's talking about America. He says, I get on one of our freeways here and I think, my, how many people there are. But then I go back to Dallas, Texas, and I think that everyone has followed me from California to Texas. The crowds are everywhere. I go to Florida or to New York City and it seems the people have followed me there. I've never seen such crowds in my life. I went to Europe several years ago and found that the people were there also. The multitudes which are in the Orient also almost shock us. And in Egypt, in the Arab countries and in Turkey, there are multitudes of people. It causes me to think, man, I hope the Lord remembers that my name is Vernon McGee and that I have trusted him. I'm very happy that the scripture says, he knoweth them that trust in him. My friend, he doesn't need a computer to record your name. Actually, he has you written on his heart. He's written your name on the palms of his hands. He knows you. He knows those who've trusted him. What a most blessed and privileged people we are today. We who are saved. Kings, queens, presidents, prime ministers. They probably don't have a clue as to who we are. But isn't it wonderful today that he who is the king of glory, he knows us by name and he knows everything about us. He knows our troubles. He knows our trials. He knows every pain that we experience in life. He knows every heartbreak that we go through. He knows when we have the good times as well. And isn't it lovely that through it all, the Lord is good to us. Say judgment was coming upon Nineveh. Judgment from God. And yet the wonderful truth was that God would protect his own. Yet when I think of all of this, I think of that we are what the days that we're living in because we think of it in terms of the end times as well, don't we? The judgment is coming. What is it we read in Hebrews 7 and verse 25? It is appointed on the man once to die. But after this, the judgment. The simple reality is this, he will separate the sheep from the goats. Those who are his, he will usher them home. Those who are not, and he, we know that he says he knows them that are his. So that means as well, he knows them who are not his. And what is it he will do? What is it the Lord Jesus Christ will say to many in that day? Depart from me. I never knew you. Part in the judgment, eternal judgment, hell, 
to leave the Father. And that's what it will be for those who never knew him and he never knew. That's what it will be for all of eternity. But today, where do you stand before God? You might be able to fool others. The simple reality is this. You will never be able to fool God. He knows those of us today who are his. And he knows those of you today who are not his. You do not come today because you trust in him. He is coming. He's delayed it because he's longing that you be saved. You do not come today because you trust in him. And be able then to go home from here today saying, The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows them that trust and a mighty fortress is our God. That's a blessing to those of us who are saved. We look forward to the best days yet when we shall be in heaven, go to be with him forever. For those who are not saved, but today you need to come put your trust in him. May you do so when you have opportunity.